So now that we've gotten our, uh, we've kind of described the model, we've defined what a Turing machine is, um, and now what we're going to need to do is start to really hone in on what this what this uh, subject is about. And really, if I had to describe in one word what computability theory is all about, it's it's the the study of difficulty as a notion, as an idea. And difficulty as a word uh, applies to, of course, tasks, things that we have to do. Um, and those tasks could be kind of fluid in terms of, uh, uh, you know, what what's desired. It might be a task that, that requires some creativity or, or something, but all that we really require in order to talk about the difficulty of it, it, dif difficulty of it is that it's a concrete task with a, with a goal that's tangible. Um, and so basically what we need to do, I think now is have a, a, a discussion, sort of another kind of philosophical kind of thing before we get into just defining things, I could jump in and just define, uh, you know, time and space complexity and all that. But I think we really need to start off by talking about difficulty and, and what it is that we're really trying to do here. So I made a little PowerPoint to go through. So the question at hand, in computability theory, we're always interested in analyzing uh, the difficulty of, of problems, of computational problems. But really, honestly, I don't even want to use that word, just problems. Um, but what is difficulty? It's, 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 a, it's a word we use a lot, um, and we use it as if it's a quantity. We, we talk about how difficult something is. We talk about uh, this thing being more difficult than that thing. We treat it as a quantity already. Um, and that has to be a, a philosophical starting point. Um, and, and it's an interesting quantity in the sense that we've used it as a quantity for a long time, but we've never even, let alone uh, found a way to quantify it, we've never even considered trying to. Um, and there's a couple of words like this that have, that have uh, historically been an important part of, of math in the last you know, century or two. Uh, another word that's similar to difficulty in that it's, it's it was, a, it was something we referred to as a quantity, but had, didn't become formalized into math for a very long time was, was the idea of, of information. That's another quantity. People talk about information like it's a quantity. They say that's too much information or, or something like that. And that, you know, all of that implies that information is some kind of quantity that you should be able to measure and, and think about. Um, uh, and, and, and yeah, that, that's a deep philosophical question, difficulty and information, both of those Fleshing those quantities out with some kind of rigor is difficult, um, but that's what we need to do. Uh, but unlike information, difficulty, I think, as a quantity is something much more complicated. It's a very rare case um, of a quantity that isn't quite a quantity in the normal sense. It's, it's an ordinal quantity. Let me jump to the next question. So, you know, as with any quantity, to some extent, uh, there's ways to categorize as well as quantify, right? There's qualitative and quantitative distinctions. And um, so what's a, there's one natural way that we have already in order to consider a problem as hard or not hard. And that is of course the notion of computability. Um, it seems reasonable to say that if a problem is uh, not computable, then it's probably pretty difficult. Um, in fact, you know, you could argue that it's probably infinitely more difficult than any problem that is computable. And that's really where you start to realize when you say that, that difficulty is in some sense an ordinal quantity. Now the ordinal numbers are um, a, a generalization of the natural numbers. It's a continuation past infinity. So you can see the way that this picture works, I start with one and two and three, and then I can, I go on forever. And then we just kind of suppose as mathematicians that well, okay, we finished going forever, and now we're now we're here. So this is this this number here, omega, is basically the first infinity as you think about it. Um, but then we have it; we're there, um, and then we can continue infinity plus one, infinity plus two, infinity plus three, um, and then you can do that another infinity times, and you get to infinity times two, and then you can add one to that, and and you can see there's there's like there's tiers. You can keep quantifying past infinity, and in some sense you can see like. Going to infinity here, uh, it's going to be more complicated than this, but going, you know, this, you can kind of think of this first traveling along to infinity as uh, a scaling difficulty, a scale of difficulties for computable problems. And now we exit the scale of computable problems. You can still, there's going to be ways to categorize difficulty of problems. Not all uncomputable problems that will be created equal. There will be some 
computer so there will be some non-computable problems that will be more difficult than other non-computable problems. We'll end up with another hierarchy. Um, and it, it'll, in some sense, go on forever. And it'll, in some sense, go on forever before you even get to the exit of, of computability. Um, you get lots and lots of different kind of layered hierarchies, layered quantifications when it comes to difficulty. It's a very interesting quantity in that sense. Um, and by the way, this number here, omega, is obviously very different than, say, 2. Um, we call 2 over here, uh, well, we call, we, we, call, we call omega a limit ordinal, whereas this is, this is just a regular number. What do they call those? Uh, a successor ordinal, right. So 2 is a successor ordinal. It succeeds something. Omega is a limit ordinal. It doesn't succeed anything. It succeeds everything. Um, and so limit ordinals are kind of special, but that, that's the way in they're special. They're, 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 uh, they're not succeeding anything. But this guy right here, omega plus 1, that's a successor ordinal. Um, and you can see there's other limit, limit ordinals. Omega times 2, that's a limit ordinal. Omega squared, that's a limit ordinal. In any case, um, hopefully you can see that, that difficulty as a quantity is, is very different than quantities that you're used to. And, and the process of figuring out how to quantify the difficulty of a problem is going to be reflective of that. Over here, uh, this thing right here is a visualization of omega squared, omega times omega, omega being, again, the first limit ordinal. Um, and the way to visualize it is we can count to infinity, and then we count to infinity again and add that on, and then we do that infinity many times. And you, of course, get something that looks like infinity times infinity. So this is a way to visualize omega squared. Kind of cool. Um, so. The title of the slide, obviously, is Quantity Yielding Quality Yielding Quantity. What do I mean by that? Well, we need to find a way to measure difficulty of particular computations. That's what we're going to start with. And then from this, uh, we're going to be able to define qualitative categories for difficulty. So this is going to be, that's the, that's the quantity yielding quality. We're going to find something to count, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. And then from that, we're going to be able to define categories, um, which represent certain types of difficulty. But then what's going to happen? We, you know, at that point, we've only we've categorized difficulty, but we haven't quantified it yet. We haven't figured out how to measure it. But what's going to happen is as we define these categories, we're going to look at the structure of these categories, how these categories are layered inside of each other, how they interact. And what we're going to see is that there's going to be natural hierarchies forming of the categories themselves. And that through those natural categories, we will get a way to quantify based on what category you're in. The ordering, the natural ordering that forms for these categories will end up yielding for us an actual quantification of the difficulty of problems, not just computations. Um, and that's the second, the quality yielding the quantity, qu quality yielding the quantity again. So it, it's, 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 it's going to be an interesting process in that sense. Um, so how do we begin? So we've acknowledged that difficulty is a fuzzy concept. Um, uh, we discussed it as a quantity before we even discuss, uh, discussed considering how to measure it. Um, and it's largely subjective in the way we, we use it, right? What's difficult for me might, might not be difficult for you. Um, there's some just, there's some obviously subjective nature to difficulty. And yet we should be able to still uh, talk about it in a concrete way. There, there is some objectiveness to it. It's not a purely subjective thing. Um, and it's clearly very real. There are clearly problems, some problems that are more difficult than others. That's obvious. Um, so we have an interesting task on our hands, especially if you're more used to the STEM fields, if you're used to physics and stuff. Because the physicists, they have quantities that are very kind of easy to think about in the sense that they defined them via their measurement tools. They defined charge because they had tools to measure charge. And so they have measurements that they make and they define words for the measurements. They defined charge based on the measurement in some sense. We, ex we have the exact opposite problem. Uh, and And so in order to solve our problem in order to figure out how to deal with something like difficulty uh we're gonna we're gonna go to the pros we're gonna talk to the social scientists we're gonna we're gonna see what they do so a social scientist they deal with quantities like this all the time things that people talk about that are quantities uh but but aren't really quantities that people think to measure so one example that comes to mind for me maybe is uh the the idea of, of social isolation right uh, people can talk about social isolation. We can talk about, we know it's a real thing, uh, but how do you measure it? Well, we don't measure it. We don't have a way to measure it. It's, it's a philosophical quantity like difficulty or information. 
but the social scientists still want to prove things about it. So, you know, for example, a social scientist might want to might might make the might make the claim that uh, the amount of social isolation one feels uh, increases as the length of the working day increases. So, somebody with a twelve-hour working day uh, is going to feel more social isolation and and demonstrate more uh, behaviors that are associated with social isolation uh, than somebody that works, let's say, an eight-hour day. And they want to test this theory. They want to test this theory, but they know that whatever definition that they try to come up with for it uh, is going to get a lot of flack. So, so what do they do? Well, what they do is they come up with what's called an operational definition for it. They, they don't bother to define it. Instead, what they do is that they, they identify some key behaviors and, and, and measurement and, and, and concrete things that they can measure that would naturally be associated with um, uh, social isolation. So for, for example, maybe Maybe the social scientist says, what I'm going to do is I'm going to interview, I'm going to, I'm going to follow the lives of 30 different people, 15 of which work a 12 hour day, 15 of which work a eight hour day. And I'm going to watch, I'm going to, I'm going to measure how much time they spend talking to friends and relatives outside of work, um, each group. Um, and, 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 and the reason that that experiment can actually test the claim that social isolation scales with uh, the working day is that they can, uh, you know, check to see, I mean, is, is basically the idea that, that if you're socially isolated, you're going to spend less time uh, talking to your friends and family outside of work. That's the idea. Is, is it completely defined by that? No, of course not. Uh, but nonetheless, it, uh, it's going to, not many people are going to disagree that that is at least evidence. Um, and, and this is when the kind of the magic of the scientific method comes in is because you're testing against a theory. You never test to prove something true. And so as other scientists conduct their own experiments regarding social isolation, they're going to come up with their own operational definitions. And then over time, you're going to get a, all of these different things that point to the fact that social isolation increases without even actually defining what social isolation is explicitly. All these different, other, all these different scientists conducting all their own experiments all of which have their own operational definitions, the, the sheer amount of different operational definitions will eventually work in the favor of proving something true. Something, something true about a quantity that you never really figured out what it fundamentally is and you weren't even, you never even needed to. Now that's what they do. We're gonna do something slightly different, but we're gonna start out in the same way that they do. We're gonna come up with an operational definition for difficulty. Now, how do we do that? Um, well. We have to make an assertion. We have to say, if a problem is difficult, it's going to require a lot of some resource of interest within any computational model. So what I mean by that is, um, say a problem is difficult. I hand you a computational model. The assumption is that there's got to be some resource uh, that, that a lot of is used within that model. Otherwise, it wouldn't be difficult. Now, that assertion is in some sense reliant on, on the equivalence of different computational models, which is something we will show. Um, but assuming that's the case, then you know, there should be a corresponding research, resource within any computational model that has to be uh, taxed a lot in order to solve a problem if a problem is difficult. That's the first assertion we're going to make, and I think it's reasonable. Uh, and if that's the case, then the key word there is any, any computational model. And therefore, we can pick the one we've been talking about, the Turing machine model. So therefore, we're going to fix a computational model, and we're going to define uh, resources, which we can keep track of, and the amount of resources used is going to form for us basically an operational definition of the difficulty of a computation, not a problem. So we're only one step there. We haven't quite gotten to the difficulty of a problem yet, um, but we'll talk about that in a minute. That's the reason, that, that's one of the main reasons we picked Turing machines, is because Turing machines have two very natural resources associated with them, time and space. So we're going to define these more formally in a little bit, but by time, what we mean is the number of steps which it takes for computation to halt. Um, so Annette, remember, we start out in an initial configuration with respect, you know, that's determined by the input, and then we have this notion of steps that are determined by the transition function, 
And eventually, you get to a halting configuration. And the number of times that, that the number of steps that need to happen, that's what we're going to define as the time. And, and that's a resource use, right? Not everyone has all the time. So naturally, and, and this is the cool thing about Turing machines, is that naturally, because the Turing machine model has a direct correspondence to somebody doing a computation themselves in real life, there's a very natural correspondence between time, as we've described, this discrete number of steps in a Turing machine computation, and and the amount of, and am, amount of time in seconds that somebody would spend doing something, or alternatively, uh, time spent by a modern computer to compute something. So time as a, as a resource defined from Turing machines, uh, even without any talk of like operational definitions or anything, really naturally uh, translates to uh, believable assertions about uh, how much time it takes to do things outside of Turing machines. Next, we have space. And by space, we mean uh, the amount of scratch paper you need. And in a Turing machine sense, this means the number, the maximum number of tape cells that are used at any point during a computation. Uh, and again, in a modern computer, this would correspond to the amount of memory, the amount of RAM, I guess, that, uh, uh, that you need in order to solve a problem. Uh, you know, there's other examples. There's, there's, you can, there's, in some sense, an infinite number of, of resources that you can define. Um, most of them are neglected, and in many ways, you only really need one. In, in many ways, you, you, we'll, we'll prove in certain senses that if you prove a lot of things about one resource, you've sort of proven things about all of them. Um, but nonetheless, there is one more I wanted to mention while I'm here. Uh, something that's been a, it's, a, it's a very neglected Turing machine resource that I, I think should get more attention. Um, that I'll call ink. I've, heard, I've seen it called ink before, I think, somewhere, um, which is the number of times that a symbol is replaced by a distinctly different symbol. So it's the number of times that I have to or actually erase a symbol and replace it with something, which is which doesn't always happen, right? Sometimes you don't replace the symbol, you just move the cursor around or don't even move the cursor around. Um, and the reason that ink, I think, is important is, one, it corresponds to something very natural. It does correspond to a resource. It corresponds to the amount of ink or lead used or kind of in the mirror image of that. Uh, the, num the amount of your eraser or amount of whiteout that you use on the page. Um, but the, that's not why ink is an important resource, I think. The reason why I think ink is an important resource to, to think about is that there's this print, there's this theorem called Landor's principle. I don't know how to say his name. Landauer, Lander, uh, Launder, I don't know. Uh, but, but this guy has a principle, and, and the principle basically is this, and it's true, this is a fact, um, kind of. Uh, the, it basically is the assertion that uh, the only time that energy needs to actually be used during a computation is when information is deleted. And uh, this becomes an important principle in quantum mechanics, quantum computing, I should say. Uh, but, but more importantly, what it means is that in kind of an idealistic sense, if you make, if you make your computer perfect, uh, then it's sort of, you, you know, deleting a, a symbol, you know, replacing a symbol with another one involves deleting the old symbol. Meaning that in some sense, the, this ink resource is a measure of heat generation. Um, because that when you when you erase the symbol, you're generating heat, um, you're deleting something. So I, I think ink is going to be a, become a more and more important resource uh, as technology develops, as quantum computing develops, and as people think more about uh, a lot of different things. I think it's going to come into trend. I think it's going to become trendy soon. So again, I mentioned earlier, we can describe the n amount of resources used in a specific computation, but we're not interested in computation, remember. We're interested in the difficulty of a problem. So you know, how do we take this keeping track of resource uses with a specific computation and sort of extrapolate from that statements about an entire problem? Because remember, a computational problem can take multiple inputs. It's, it's, a, it's a collection of yes or no answers. And so every problem involves infinitely many different computations. So we need to find a way to, to take our, our statements about, about, um, about Turing machines, about, about specific computations, and uh, sort of extend those, those individual uh, resource tracking exercises and take those and extend them to uh, saying something about the difficulty of an entire problem. And the reasonable assumption that's going to be key to doing that is this. The more complicated an input, uh, the more resources we should expect to be used. Um, meaning that what we need to look at not so, is not so much the amount of resources used in a specific computation, but the function itself, the function that takes uh, the length of an input to the amount of resources used. Um, 
we can always assume that when we have a Turing machine, which decides a problem, uh, all computations of a, of a given input length will be of the same uh, amount. We'll use the same amount of any resource. Uh, I feel like we might get off track for me to justify that, but you know, you what, what I'm trying to say is that we won't need to worry about um, inputs of two different lengths using a different amount of resources. We will be able to assume, uh, for reasons I'll justify in a little bit, that. Uh, the 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 number of steps of a computation is exclusively a function of the input length rather than the input itself. That's a safe assumption to make. We can we can prove that. Um, it's a simple argument, but I don't want to get into it. But because of that, this assumption not becomes more than just reasonable. It becomes the only thing you could possibly look at. So what we need to look at is basically this: How does resource usage scale with the input size? Maybe I should explain why this is true. So if I have a, a string of length n. And there's and sigma has two symbols in it, then two to the n uh, strings of length n. The important thing about this is that two to the n is less than infinity, um, and so because two to the n is less than infinity, it's finite. I can just take the maximum, take the ma take the maximum number of steps used on strings of length n. Uh, and so, so, I mean, out of this finite number of strings, one of them is going to use the most uh, of, of any given resource. And we can just basically install an alarm clock and, and what I mean by that is uh, it's going to halt earlier, but then instead of halting, just just have it uh, go into like a temporary state and count until you get to that number of steps and then halt. Um, same thing can be done with space and, and any resource. So we can always assume because of the because of the ability to install an alarm clock and the and the fact that our, our alphabet is finite, we can always assume that uh, you know we can always assume uh, that computation time that computation resource usage. Um, amount of resource used is purely a function of input length. That's the big takeaway. It's because of this fact, um, which we'll prove in more detail later on, um, that we can ex that we can take this assumption from being just being reasonable to. Uh, uh, a much stronger phrase than a reasonable assumption. So that's my sort of philosophical segue into into, uh, into um, thinking about resource usage.